number 19. We're currently in a series on hope. Today, does hope change us? I'm Ron Shepard. I'm a member here at First Christian Church in Carrollton, Georgia. Welcome. A couple of announcements. Number one, if you have any prayer concerns, please send them to Paul at 1stchristianchurch.com. They'll be shared with the prayer team, the elders, and the senior pastor, Randy Barnhart. Two, we are meeting on campus now. But if you're unable to attend at 9 or 11, we are on Facebook and YouTube. Three, the church's missions and activities and programs continue to be funded. We need your help. One way to give is go to 1stchristianchurch.com. Click the buttons. You'll find easy instructions to follow. Two, you can text 1STCC73256. Three, the United States mail to our office, and four, on site. We have a collection box in the hallway as you enter, and whether it's 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock, and you can drop your tithes and offerings uh, there. Before we pray, when you access this program, please feel free to access the 10 questions that accompany the lesson. They're designed to help you dig deeper. And if you're watching it with people, friends, family, discuss them amongst yourself. Hope you'll take advantage of those questions. Let's pray. Father God, lesson number three on hope, does it change us? Uh, I just pray that you would be with the messenger and you would be with the audience that would be a relevant and meaningful and uplifting message. That's my prayer. In Christ's name, amen. Now, we oftentimes will use the word change. For example, we have to change our plans, especially during this COVID crisis. A lot of things have changed. Two, sometimes we're going in the wrong direction, so we change course. Three, if you still use cash, currency, you may go into a store and say, do you have change for a $20 bill? Well, today's change is about a conversion experience that not only changes us, but give us hope. So let's talk about this hope. You should be looking right now at a question. Does hope in Christ change us? So if you'll read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 to 18, it says, Therefore, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone away, the new is here. That's from the NIV Bible. So what has changed when you were converted? What changed in your life? What about your attitude? More positive? More open? What about your behavior? What about relationships? Did that change? Did you change the places that you went to? Did you stop going to some places? Did your vocabulary change? Anything about your lifestyle that changed after you were saved? My guess is things did change. So I'm not suggesting that when you become a Christian, a believer, a follower, I'm not suggesting in any way, shape, or form you're perfect. I am suggesting that there has been a do-over, a changeover. You're not perfect, but there has been a spiritual do-over. Years and years ago back in Frankfort, Indiana, when Community Christian Church opened its doors for the first time and we had a dedication ceremony, one of the elders, who also happened to be a preacher, Chuck Bergen, made this comment during the, his opening remarks. We dedicate Community Christian Church as a hospital for the sick. Let me repeat that. A hospital for the sick. We're not perfect. We're sinners saved by grace. And in many ways, we are sick. So. We are not perfect, but our sins are forgiven, and we're promised the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So let's take a look at another New Testament reference. It's in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. We are thus his ambassadors. We represent him to conduct his affairs through service, through worship, through obedience. Every time the president appoints an ambassador, let's say to the court of St. James in Great Britain, that ambassador represents the president. Whatever the president wants done, said to the queen, to the prime minister, to parliament, that's what the ambassador does. That's what we become when we become 
his followers. Well, let's take a look at another New Testament reference. It's in Romans chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. Thanks be to God that we were once slaves to sin, but when we believed and obeyed, we have thus been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Now, there's a couple of questions in the section that follows this lesson that deals with that. A slave from sin to a slave to righteousness. What does that mean to you? Now, righteousness means that our goal is to follow him. He becomes our commander-in-chief, and he gives us our marching orders. We have a new status. You know, if you want to see something really thrilling and encouraging, Google immigration. And take a look at all those photos of immigrants who have lived here three years, who have passed the immigration test, and are getting ready to take the oath of obedience to the American Constitution. It's really quite encouraging. They have a new status. They are now an American. And that's what happens to us when we were changed. Our status becomes new. So let's take a look at an Old Testament reference to this new status. It's found in Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 26 and 27. I will give you a new heart. Now he's speaking to the nation of Israel, but I think he's also speaking to us today, making it relevant. I'm going to give you a new heart, and I'm going to put my spirit in you to follow my decrees and to be careful to keep my laws. Well, let's go back to the New Testament. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. This hope, think Jesus, this hope has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. I want to focus on that word poured, not sprinkled. This is a two-gallon watering can. My pansies, my daylilies, my plants love this. When I pour two gallons on my plants within minutes, they begin to straighten up. I think that's what Jesus meant there, what Paul meant there, when he says, I will pour my spirit in you. It's not going to be a little trinkle. It's not going to be just a little dab, or do you? It's going to be a major point. We get that promise. We're changed, a new status. Now, do hope and promise change us? I think the answer is yes. Well, how do we get this hope? How do we get this hope that will change our lives? How do we get it if we can't hear it, if we can't see it, if we can't read it? So just imagine with me. Just imagine. And this is one of the questions that I hope you will discuss among your friends and family. What if, what if there were no church? Think of your church. Think of First Christian Church. No Sunday school. No life group. No Bible colleges. No Bibles. No famous Christian authors. Maxwell, Lucado, C.S. Lewis, N.T. Wright, Tim Keller, on and on and on. What if there were no television ministries? What if there were no Facebook or YouTube services? What if? What if we lived in a country where Christian worship was outlawed, suppressed, censored, pastors arrested, Worship centers burned down. Believers put in jail, paying fines. Bibles burn. Christian literature censored, or get this, Bibles rewritten. Now, if you want to Google something scary, you Google churches under persecution or persecuted churches. You may find a list of 10, the top 10 countries that persecute, harass Christianity. I won't mention them. You can Google them for yourselves, but I will say this. Of the ten, two are under major communist oppression. Six or seven are under Islamic suppression, and two are under atheistic dictatorships. Churches being suppressed, churches being censored. Imagine if you were able to go to a store and buy a Bible that has been completely Rewritten. How would you know the truth? So given these issues, these topics in the previous slide, 
Could we continue to worship and believe? Would we have to become a silent follower? Can you be a believer and hidden? In other words, can you be a secret believer? Well, let's take a look at some secret believers from Scripture. One is found in 1 Kings 19. You're going to know this guy up front. His name is Elijah. And in 1 Kings 19, he's in a cave, and he's throwing himself a pity party. Woe is me. Queen Jezebel is after me. King Ahab is after me. I'm on the run. I'm alone. Wow. And God comes to him and says, no, you're not alone. I've got 7,000 hidden saints who have not bowed down before Baal. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but I think God probably said, Elijah, come out of that cave and stop that pity party. Well, let's go to the New Testament. Philippians chapter 4, verse 22. Philippians 4, 22. Okay? Paul sends greetings to the people in the church at Rome. Think Caesar. Think multiple gods. Think it's scary to be a Christian. Think of Christians, Paul, in prison. Okay? In Philippians 4, 22, Paul is sending greeters to those working in Caesar's household. <laughs> Did you get that? They're working in Caesar's household, and they're believers. How does that work? How would that look on a YouTube video, to be a follower of Christ working in Caesar's household who had outlawed Christianity? Or let's go to Romans 16, verses 7 to 15. Romans 16, starting in verse 7. Paul is going to list the names of 28 believers in the Roman area who are following Christ. They are following Christ in a secular, atheistic, multi-God city. I don't know those names, and I bet you you don't either, but God does. And that's probably the key there. And maybe that's why Paul listed them, so those of us whose names are not known can take hope that God knows those names. So let's take a look at something that the early Christians do. It's called a first century acrostic. Think a poem or a puzzle with hidden meaning. So I'm going to attempt to pronounce these words, and forgive me, I know I will butcher them. Here we go. Ictius, Jesus, Christos, Theo, Ios, Soter. Translation, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Now, the early Christians had a really interesting way of identifying themselves secretly. It's called a fish design, ictius. Two intersecting lines were adopted by the early Christians during the persecution as a secret symbol. So you'd meet a person, and maybe what you would do on your hand or in the dust, in the dirt, you would draw one of the lines of that fish. If he were a believer, he would draw the other line, which meant you two were now identified as believers. It's almost like a secret handshake. It's almost like code that spies would do during the Cold War to identify one another. Like maybe I'm a spy, and the person I'm meeting is a spy, and I might go up to him and say, Tiffy Canoe, and he'd respond, Tiffy Canoe and Tyler too indicating he knew something about an American presidential election. Typical new in Tyler II. That's how the early Christians could practice their faith, but yet still be hidden from the authorities. Okay? But what if? What if? Worst case. What if the government outlawed religion, churches, centered religious worship? Well, how will the folks hear? How will they read? How will they have hope? and experience a transformed life if they can't hear or read. So let's go back to history. Now, for some of us who are senior citizens, we may remember this, but for 12 years, such countries like Poland, Austria, Hungary, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, suffered under the cruel regime and the boot of Adolf Hitler. We thought in April of 45, when Germany surrendered, that ended. No, the boot became heavier. From 1945 until 1991, Winston Churchill made this quote 
in 1946 at a speech in Fulton, Missouri. And here's what he said. An iron curtain has descended from Stettin in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic. An iron curtain has descended across the continent. And we know that iron curtain as Soviet communism. These areas have suffered under Hitler, but they're going to suffer much more and much longer under Stalin and atheistic communism. You see, Stalin agreed with Karl Marx. When Karl Marx wrote in his Communist Manifesto, religion is the opiate, opium of the people. It poisons the brain. So Stalin is simply going to erase religion from society. The Russians closed down churches, turned them into museums, bars, cafes, nightclubs, discotheques. Why? No church, no worship. He attempted to erase the church, God, from Russian history. If you want to read about that, read George Orwell's book, 1984, and read about the Ministry of Education, how they rewrite history and take people out of history, making them an unperson. I had a professor in graduate school who told this story about Beria. Lavrenti, I mispronounced his first name, Beria. In the early 50s, he was the head of Stalin's KGB, the secret police. He also wanted to become the ruler of Russia. Historians differ on this, but chances are Stalin had Beria killed. My graduate history professor told this story. Upon Beria's death, Stalin gave the orders to take all books, articles, documents about Beria and erase them. All photos, pictures, graphics of Beria, erase them and in his place put articles about the Bering Sea. Beria became an unperson. Stalin was trying to make the church and God and the Bible and Christ unpeople. So how will people hear and believe and have hope and have their lives changed? Well, the underground churches. Google that, underground churches. You'll get some great photos of underground churches. Now, why is it so important that we hear about faith? Romans chapter 10, verse 17 says, faith comes from learning and hearing God's word. God always has had and will continue to raise up people. Think his remnant. Hey, Elijah, there's 7,000 people that haven't bowed. Hey, remember, I took a remnant of my people and I took them out of Egypt and took them into the promised land. So we always had these people who have been a remnant, who have sacrificed their lives so people will hear and see and read about the gospel. So let's take a look at one. You may have read his book, God's Smuggler, Brother Andrew. Okay, he was raised up, 1955. He created the open door ministry to folks behind the Iron Curtain. And here was his prayer. I love this prayer. Google Brother Andrew. I think you'd really enjoy reading about him. But here's his prayer. Lord, in my luggage I have Bibles. I want to take them to your children. When you were on earth, you made blind eyes to see. Now, Lord, I pray for you to make seeing eyes to be blind. Do not let the guards see those things you don't want them to see. So let's take a look at another person that God raised up. His name is Gene Doolin. And in 1957, in Toronto, Canada, he created an organization called TCN, Taking Christ to the Millions. In 1963, Tony Twist became the director and has been the director ever since. 1975, TCM moved its headquarters to Indianapolis, Indiana, and they serve Europe and China. Their headquarters in Indianapolis is also a headquarter in Vienna, Austria, House Edelweiss. And that's where people throughout Europe can go for weeks of training in teaching, Sunday school, Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, Hebrew, and Greek. Why? So they can go back to Hungary, Poland, 
Czechoslovakia, Romania, and teach the people there. How will the people know? Unless they hear and unless they're taught. Well, let's continue. Literature, literature and teaching ministries. Joplin, Missouri, they take the Bible and they take Christian work and they translate it into all kinds of languages. Chinese, Mandarin, Islamic languages, Spanish, Portuguese, you name it, they do it. Why? So the people can read and study and have their lives change. We have within our own church here at First Christian Church, South India Christian Mission, founded by Dick and Susan Engel, that works with the Hindu communities in country. We also have people in this church who have gone to and support various missions in Haiti. Haiti is one of the most underprivileged countries in the world, and these people don't have the money to learn or to be taught. So we have folks who go there, and we have mission programs that support these various missions in, in Haiti, like Lifeline Christian Missions. So how can they hear and believe unless they're taught? Well, that's because God has raised somebody up to do that. And my guess is those of you in the viewing audience, you probably have a favorite mission. You may belong to a church that has multiple missions, and that's great. You're doing what these men and women have done at the risk of their lives. So let's go back to an Old Testament story that is really thrilling, in my opinion, and I'm unanimous in my opinion. And I would encourage you sometime this week, read the book of Ezra and read the book of Nehemiah. That's where this story comes from, Ezra and Nehemiah. So here we go. The Jews have been taken to Babylonian, Babylon for 70 years of captivity. There's a remnant left in Jerusalem, but there's no temple. There is nobody to teach them. So God is going to raise up a king of Babylon who's going to feel some degree of loyalty and respect and concern about the people in Jerusalem. The walls have been destroyed. There's no temple. So Zerubbabel will be sent back. He's going to build the temple. Then Nehemiah will be sent back from Babylon. He's going to rebuild the eight outside walls of Jerusalem. Okay? And then he's going to send back Ezra who's a priest and a scribe, a holy man, a man of intellect, and he's going to rekindle worship. So the temple is going to be rebuilt, the walls rebuilt, and worship is going to be rebuilt. Now this story in Nehemiah, go to chapter 8 and read it. The people are going to build this huge wooden stand. And Nehemiah, from dawn until noon, 6 a.m. to noon, he's going to preach and teach. He's not going to have a microphone like I am, but he's going to stand on a platform so that people can see and hear him. And on that platform are the names of some 13 priests who are going to stand with him in support. So it's a visual image as the people are below looking up to see Ezra. They also see these priests in unison. Hey, we're back in Ezra. So if you've ever watched a president of the United States sign an important piece of legislation into law. Behind him will be Democrats, Republicans, member of his cabinet, unity, all for one, one for all. It sends a message today. School boards throughout Georgia, school boards throughout the United States, they're struggling. Do we go back face to face? Do we go back all virtual? Do we go back hybrid? I'm glad I'm a retired teacher. But I'll tell you what, if I'm a superintendent of a major school corporation and it's time for us to make the announcements, I want that video camera on me, but I want standing behind me my school board, my school board, because as I make this announcement to parents and faculty and students, I want them to know this was not a unilateral decision, team effort, team effort. I think that sends a very positive message, and that's what's taking place here with Ezra. Now get this, when you read Nehemiah chapter 8 and chapter 9, he's going to speak for six hours. But we don't just have 13 people up there on the stage, we've got 13 scribes, intelligent men, walking around the crowd, interpreting. Now remember, you've got two groups of people in this crowd. 
you've got Jews who for 70 years have not heard God's message. They've not heard about the first five books of the Old Testament. They may have forgotten the Ten Commandments. You've got refugees who've come back from Babylonia, Babylon, who may have forgotten the Hebrew language. They may be speaking Babylonian, Assyrian, some somatic tribal language. They don't know what Ezra's talking about in Hebrew. So these 13 men are out there on the ground walking about making sure that the men and women understand what he's saying. And maybe, just maybe, they're translating. It's quite possible what they're doing is translating to these two crowds. And as you read Nehemiah 8 and 7, chapter 8 and 7, he's going to stand by one of the eight gates. Just so happens to be the water gate. Yes, water gate, water gate is scriptural, okay? That's where the, the uh, temple servants live, by the way, if you're interested. And if you've got a really good Bible commentary, you may have a photo of those eight gates. Well, those are the ones that Nehemiah is rebuilding. But he's going to speak for seven days from six until noon. Now, I don't know if they took a break. <laughs> I don't know if some of those priests held him up, but he's going to speak for seven days. And when you get through with Nehemiah 8, Read what happens in Nehemiah 9. Those folks heard. They believed. They repented. They were on their knees. They were saying amen. They put on sackcloth. They put head, uh, dirt on their head, which was indicative of sorrow and repentance. Their life had been changed. They had been renewed because they heard and had explained to them the message. Nehemiah 8 and nine. That's your assignment this week. So let's conclude today's lesson about hope changes us with a scripture from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Psalms 37, 5, 6, Jude 24, 25. Only one chapter in Jude, okay? Psalm 37, 5, 6 says this. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him for he will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, your vindication, which means you've been cleansed, you've been justified, your vindication as the noonday sun. There's your hope for a changed life. And Jude 24, 25, as we conclude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling or falling into sin and to present you unblemished, blameless, faultless, in the presence of his glory with triumphant joy and unspeakable delight to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and power before all time and forever. Folks, that ought to give us hope. That ought to give us hope to live daily a changed life. Amen.